Now you know we're recording because I'm self-deprecating, but in instead of me making uh, bad attempts at humour, let me get into this because um, I don't think this young man's ready for this. I've got to be honest, I have more prep time than I would normally a lot so let's let's get into it here ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages welcome to this edition of the house and show my name is lawn i'm the host today we welcome a talented musician rapper battler and as we may discover a kindred spirit with myself with regards to one important figure in pop culture and music that we happen to share in common but he's been producing music for over 10 years as evidenced by his youtube channel which has garnered over 145,000 subscribers his latest offering the album aquarium released in 2022 is an interesting and complex exhibition of his talents as a performer and an artist. So please join me in welcoming the man with the name that would not be out of place on a 1980s action movie cover, a WWE superstar's Titan Tron, or indeed on the shirt of one of the uh, best battle rappers and most intriguing competitors of his day. Ladies and gentlemen, Red Wolf joins us. Hey, good to be here, man. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure to, pleasure to finally speak. It's um, my pleasure too. So I want to start, if I may, with the kindred spirit line because I think that will segue us nicely into your music, which is, and it's and it's weird, it's it's not the best jump off point for you, I will concede, because it was a bit of a departure. You recorded a tribute to Chester Bennington and you sang it fucking imperiously. And I want to get into that in a minute, but one, one of the things I wanted to talk about is your musical diet, your, like, um, how you express it, because your, your stuff is varied it's it's not every time i click on a song of yours i get a little susan i get a little different here a little different note and then obviously that was like whoa where did that come from so what i wanted to ask is what do you look at as music as far as your your figure of expression like how do you how do you go into deciding how you want to go about it since you seem quite talented in the sense that you can approach it however you want to you don't have to limit yourself to a certain style deliver deliverance cadence that sort of thing Exactly. Like, um, I suppose, I mean, when it comes to Chester Bennington in particular and Linkin Park, I mean, like Chester Bennington was the very first musician that I ever that got me. He was the musician that got me into music, really. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it was his voice on the radio playing on this random South Florida station I listened to when I was like five years of age and uh, hearing in the end when it like came out. And it was it, it was really you know, it, it captivated me. It got me into music, you know, and it was th that was the band. And as far as like uh, choosing styles that I do even today and, you know, approaching all it, it's as simple as I want to do that. I'm going to see how well I can approach doing that. I mean, I got into rock and metal first before I got into rap. You know, um, so like I, I, you, you'd hear me in my room as a kid trying to like e e emulate the screaming and the harsh vocals and stuff terribly, of course. But like with time and then with practice, you know, and getting older, I got better at it. Um, but like um, as far as picking styles and just kind of doing a whole bunch of different shit, it's just really it's just I want to do it. So I'll do it. You know, I don't want to restrict myself because you see a lot of people, you know, they have to have a specific brand. You know, they have to have a recognizable brand. And I do think from a business perspective, that is important as an artist. But like um, my whole shtick, I suppose, is just a little bit of everything, you know, and blend it all into this sound I end up creating called Red Wolf. You know what I mean? So it's as simple as that, I suppose. The, the reason I bring it up is, is the irony of it is I'm put in mind of Mike Shinoda in the sense that ultimately Mike was the one who was behind a lot of the lyrics and the direction of the band and it was influences of Chester and it was influences of other people. But I, like you, I fell in love with the Chester Bennington performer element of him and how emotional and visceral he was and how he just sort of, he was a vocalist who you could never quite emulate you might hit certain notes you might get certain patterns but then he'd hit you with a succession of things and you go fucking hell how did he do that and i loved listening to your um your your tribute uh, the, the recording of numb that you did because when that's juxtaposed with the mf doom tribute that you did and then you juxtapose that with the uh, the the, the uh, aquarium stuff it's so interesting to me to see that you do experiment, you do try different things. And I wondered, like, as a musician, as an artist, I know I struggle with this, and I imagine you do too. It's how do you, how do you limit it? How do you hone in? How do you fixate on certain ideas when, in theory, you could go in any, in any direction and be successful with it, or at least you, you'd probably derive some satisfaction knowing the execution's there. But like you say, you have to balance what the audience expectation is of you sometimes 
But you, because again, you're talented. You've got these different avenues you can explore. So how do you hone it in? How do you rein it in? I guess is the, is the question. How do I hone it? So like, um, you, you kind of spit it back at you. Are you asking like how I kind of find the time to focus on so many different kind of things? Is, is, is much, simply... Yeah, because like say you've gone in, a, you've gone in a multitude of different different directions, but ultimately, you, you know, it's not not every piece of music you release is conceptual. It's some of it is conceptual to a certain degree, but then you get right back to what I think the point of you is, which is that you are relentless in your pursuit of better delivery, better lyrics, better dynamicism within your rap. And, but you've got, but then you've got that voice in your locker. How is it not the, the, the temptation to indulge in that, I guess is the question. I suppose like, it, it, it just roots back to just drive and just want like if you want it you can do it like again you know i wasn't born like people say oh he was born with this natural ability to uh to, to do. it's not that you know you can start from literally ground zero like anybody and as long as you like apply the time and dedication of something as uh fortune cookie quote as that sounds like you know you can perfect it when it came to rap you know, um, it, it was just hours and hours and, you know, constant classes of me not paying attention in school of just writing raps instead to like perfect all of the little aspects and the thousands of hours of YouTube tutorials on like producing and shit like that and mixing and mastering and like playing instruments and just wanting to do it. It's as simple as that. Like, you know, um, harsh vocals, singing in general. I mean, like, you know, all of this stuff. It was just the amount of time that I put into it, and it's just the dedication that I had to to really want to perfect it to what I believe my standard is, and I, and that standard is always raising for me because as I'm improving, like let's just say, okay, I wrote this verse, and like I I perfected one thing that I didn't improve the last time, you know, I will then notice a flaw or something that I could do better in another aspect that will then be applicable to the next thing that I do. Uh, if it's rap, it's another verse. If it's like screaming, it's the the tone, the technique, the 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 breath control. It's you know, it, it's all of these things that I'm just caught. Like I'm never happy. <laughs> I'm never fully content and happy with it for long and i'll then notice and all that it is again it's time really i mean it, it's just like you know you hear the old producer joke of just uh you're listening you're, you're doing a mix and then literally the next night when you're listening to it or the next morning when you're listening to it you're like ah oh, man now it's shit it's that but that's a good thing that's it that's actually a good thing because that's improvement you know like um if you're constantly making things and you're just constantly happy with it and you're just content of just being in this place you're never gonna exceed now you don't necessarily have to constantly be on your guard like that and constantly want if you're happy with it you're happy with it you know but i'm personally happy with like okay how can i make this a little bit better for me right but also just in general in the in the scope of what i'm doing relative to what it is you know it could be anything so that's kind of how i approach it and my mentality behind it i suppose talk to me about your first forays into it because i, I don't know if um i'd have been as reticent to get going when because youtube really wasn't a thing when i was kind of discovering my creative outlets of art and music music and stuff so i guess the question is like talk to me about the early days as it were like how did you first broach the idea that it's something you could do and how did you first overcome some of the more trivial obstacles like just getting to grips with being comfortable sync because that's a thing at first you feel a bit awkward like oh god is this cringy should i be doing this and then you know like, no i'm good no i'm good at this and i can do it talk to me about sort of your early forays into making music I suppose like it started when I was, I mean, f like I said, five listening to Linkin Park and singing along and just like getting captivated first by listening to the music and wanting to sing along to it. But then like when I discovered rap, it was a final day when I was like seven years old. Uh, no, actually, no, a bit before that, my dad got me a keyboard, you know, taught me one chord on it. Didn't need to teach me anything else. I just learned it by all the rest of the stuff by ear. And, you know, I mean, just played on that and found an interest in that and hyper fixated on that. Um, when I was eight, I uh, on one rebellious day, I stole my mom's iPod one evening and found uh, a plethora of Akon songs 
which featured a lot of like rappers on them. It was basically the Trouble album, you know what I mean? Like along with I'm So Paid with Lil Wayne, T-Pain, uh, he did Smack That with Eminem. So along with like listening to Akon and loving the melodic aspects of that, it was, you know, getting into the rappers and the other singers and the other artists that were around that era that were popping um, that led me on. It was just a, a, a domino effect of discovery, if you will. And I suppose it was, it was quite literally you know, when I started making music, when I decided I wanted to start making music is when I really dived into the production aspect. And that was when I was around like 12. So I got my first computer and um, it was a dingy old fucking Toshiba laptop and uh, like eight gigs of RAM and like ran like absolute ass. But like um, watching those thousands of hours of YouTube tutorials and mind you, you know, YouTube tutorials today are much more, you have shorts, you have shit that you can learn from in an instant like that. I didn't have that. It was, it was those type of tutorials where like, like they would, they would do the tutorial. It was a dumbass music in the background and they like do the text thing. They like open the notepad and you just have to sit there like, and just like for every little trivial thing, but I did it, you know, getting into production at 12 and just learning how songs were recorded, how uh, vocals were mixed um learning how beats were made what software was used and it was just the curiosity of asking the question how and uh i suppose yeah like you know once i kept on asking the question how i just did that for like all of my life regarding music and it, it just carried on through there so I, I i started recording little songs at around 12 and i started i released my first song um at 13 and you know it, i made the beat to it you know uh, recorded it all mixed it but like you know what i mean like the mixes were ass of course you know but it, again it was like i was saying earlier it was uh, like you know you you hear these things that you're like oh, okay this this mic is ass this is like really hissy i, I need to i need to take the, the eq down or whatever i need to do this that and the other and you know you start hearing these things as you do them and as i got older and as i started hearing understanding more concepts you know and more nuances of making music and you know everything into it i mean also just the fact of i didn't have money because i was a kid so it's just like you know you you know you got people who are grown-ass adults who are rappers who are able to throw money at engineers to do all the hard work for them and shit in terms of like the the, the engineering aspect and the producing aspect which is fine um not everybody wants to be a producer and that's cool you know some people are just cool with being a rapper some people are just cool with being a vocalist in general or just playing their instrument and they don't want to get into the nitty-gritty me, I just, you know, I just felt like, you know, how much can I do myself? You know, how much can I do on my own, you know, w w with my own brain, with my own ears, with my own talents and just, you know, and, and, and then I just did that all the time, essentially, you know, it was, it was as simple as that, I suppose. And then uh, kept on releasing music on YouTube and SoundCloud from 13 to present. And, you know, that that came with the, the pitfalls and uh, of learning and that thousands of hours of tutorials and just like trial and error and a lot of success as well you know getting shows getting a lot of you know viral hits and stuff and um yeah here we are you know and you know like three mixtapes and one album later and here we are so talk to me then about some of the successes because again when when i talk to some creators that success comes later or it comes very um it comes fleetingly, let's, let me put it that way. You don't yep. seem to have suffered from that. You seem to have been not only consistently successful, but I think also can just consistent. You seem to have a real passion for what you do in so much as, I don't know if you take, not it, 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 it's not serious to you, but I guess it's that thing of you You seem to have an, 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 an understanding of the, the, the realm that you're in, in the sense that it, man content is different from when you started even when i started because the audience is much more fickle and it comes thick and fast and relevance is such a hard thing and yet you seem to have a very steady and increasing support i guess the question i want to ask is from when you started first starting getting traction to now how have you managed your own expectations of your own success how have you or how, how, how have you gauged what success is to you considering that you've already accomplished tons and you're still a very young man. I'm old. It makes him young. Don't argue with me. The fact is, though, that you still have a really long way to go, given the passion that you have and all the stuff that you want to accomplish. So how are you 
How do you look at your success so far and how are you gauging your success moving forward in, in the era that we're in? I suppose beauty is in the eye of the beholder and I suppose that is applicable to a success as well. Like, you know, for me back in the day, it was like, oh, getting a bunch of views and, you know, like getting, but, but that, that is important. Getting an audience, getting people interested in you, you know, Wait maintaining. Wait a minute, you get views? What are these views you talk about? What the fuck are they? Oh man, just just people who ended up, you know, stumbling across my stupid face and liking what I have to say on a song, really, you know? People like it's, what you do? It's, it beats me, man. You, you, Wait, I, so I, that's, what, that's where I've been going wrong this whole time. Oh, I'm supposed to make you all like me. Oh, fuck. That's all right. I'll rewind. I'll invent a time machine. Go back. I'm sorry, but no. But seriously, like, like that that evolution is, as you say, like getting the views in the first place. Like, it's it is a spot, dude. If you if you're not a content creator, that initial video, whenever it is that exceeds your expectations of what you've done, and it goes, oh, oh, I like that. That's good. I want to do that again. And then the next one doesn't, and you're like, what did I do wrong? And you don't understand at first. You have to learn how to manage that over time. You really do. Exactly. You have to also realize that, like, like the here's the thing. I might do, like, a bunch of different shit, right? Like, I might go and make a metal song with my metal band, which, by the way, Hour of Reprisal, we're, we have some shit soon. Um, like, I might go make a metal song, like, the Numb cover. You know what I mean? Like, I could go and make, like, an R&B song. You know what I mean? I could go and make a rap song. And, you know, dipping into all of these different pockets is great. But one of the disadvantages of it is if you gain an audience through doing one thing, they might not fuck with the other. You get what I'm saying? So, like, you know, you, you have to, especially nowadays where everything is so algorithmically generated and how brand is so important and, you know, how it has to be recognized and almost uniform. And that's the disadvantage of, like, not being able to, like, dip into many different pockets, Um uh, or being able to dip into many different pockets is one audience that you gain through one thing might not like the next thing that you do. So that's that's one of the trial and errors that I've had to unfortunately face. Like that's one of the things where I was just like, uh, I, I saw a diagram uh, by this uh, great musician, uh, great content creator, Andrew Hong. Um, he's taught me a lot through watching his videos and it was a little diagram and I don't remember all of it, but one of the main parts is, uh, it, it's like a content creation diagram and it's like what I want to do what makes money and what is like doing good for me it's like you know you're separating those things and you're sort of uh gauging what works for you versus what you want to do and you know i suppose the goal uh like like, like i said beauty's in the eye of the beholder success is relative right success for me would like as a kid was oh my god viral hit sensation right but like as an adult i feel success now is making this a sustainable career making this my income you know what i'm saying like making this something that i do that puts food on the table and you don't have to get a million kajillion streams to do that you you know um kato on the track a uh, very famous producer who's worked on a lot um has done the math where you could get a hundred thousand you know, Spotify followers and get like basically relative to what's like a, a, a decent income. You know what I'm saying? Like a hundred thousand, like uh, there's, uh, I don't remember the exact number of streams now, but like if you get a certain amount of streams per month um, and obviously it's ever changing because Spotify ends up paying less to people and you know, yada, 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 but that's just one streaming service, right? Um, you know, you can make this your income uh, but but the, the, the success and what's relative to me now is being able to make that sustainable as my job, as well as, you know, like what I've always done, which is, you know, have people who resonate with what I have to say, you know, that, that that's the thing, you know, like I said, the, the, the diagram where what you want versus what works. A lot of people are in a position where it's like, OK, what they want to do isn't what makes them money. And that's makes them miserable and it doesn't make it fun to do so finding the nice middle ground between for me expressing a message um that i that, that's me you know what i mean that's red wolf that's solon um that people resonate with and finding an audience that resonates with that along with something that also works it's the, it's that blend it's that middle ground and i suppose making the brand hey i do a little bit of everything finding ways to do that while difficult isn't entirely impossible so i suppose that's that would be my gauge currently for like 
what ICE considers success, is making it sustainable while also making it something where you create shit that you just love creating, you know, and not having to, to cater to what people want rather than, you know, just people loving with what you want and you finding your audience. You know, you hear that a lot and it's like a fortune cookie quote on the goddamn internet. It's like you have to find your audience, but it's true. You know, in in a, in an era of the internet where everything is so algorithmic and everything is so fucking uniform and everything has to be super distinguishable from like what other people are doing, is you, you have to find your own lane. But it's got to be uniform. But it's got to be what you love doing. But it's got to be sustainable. It's a lot to balance, and it's not an easy job. But it's not impossible either. So that's uh, my sort of gauge for it, I suppose. I, I totally agree and it's it's something um we all struggle i mean i you know i'm now the interview guy but I, that's not how i wanted to start in fact if you want to gauge success ladies and gentlemen again go watch my first video it's dog shit but that's how we we progress as creators like you say because you learn how to steadily hone craft you you get hits you you chase these sometimes rabbit hole leads that go nowhere but Ultimately, you 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 find something you hone in and you perfect and you craft it and you hopefully in, incorporate what you've learned along the way. Which brings me to Aquarium, which is something that I've listened to over the last couple of days. And the the, the, the prevailing question I have is, what when you sit down to construct this album after the career you've had? Because again, I have questions about some of your other tracks and some of the other stuff that you've done. But I want to fixate on this because that's kind of the, a culmination of sorts. Where do you start to whittle down your influences for that? Or do you start with a core concept that you want to explore throughout the album? Is it something that you kind of, it, that you that you unilaterally apply to everything that goes into the album to know, no, that song is good, but it doesn't fit with what I'm trying to say with this? Or do you just have another core goal in mind? Or I guess I'm asking, like, how are you approaching putting it together? I suppose, like, it's a, it, sounds, it sounds almost like childlike, but it's... The aquarium concept started from something that when I was 14 years old and I just had a dream one day where I was just like of this album cover where it's just me underwater and it's just, you know, me behind the glass or something like that. And there's just a bunch of like this Atlantean city behind me. I had no concept as to like what it was going to be, what any of this shit meant. It was originally going to be called the Aquariums of Sound, but then I realized that's like corny as hell. So I just named it like Aquarium eventually, right? Um, over time, you know, it was just figuring out what I wanted to do with that project eventually. I mean, I had made my Searching of the Sounds mixtape, I made my Lonely Cold Winners mixtape, Wavy Boy, you know, but then after that, once I was like, you know what, I'm going to finally do it, it was then thinking, how am I going to make this make sense? Right. You figure that's kind of working backwards. Right. You know what I mean? It's like you should have the point and then work up to it. Right. No, nah, it was backwards. It's like, OK, I have this like vision of this cover. How am I going to like what am I going to do with it? This is the canvas that's painted for me. What am I going to do? And, and this was during a time of a lot of shit, man. Uh, my grandmother died. Um, I was going through uh, big, big bouts of depression and it was it was just a very rough time for many reasons and you know you hear it on the album i was very open book on that shit but like i had taken a break from music for over three years and um it was, it was probably one of the darkest periods of my life but then over time working on this album and being super perfectionist about it um it just ended up being about my hiatus really you know it just ended up being about that and it ended up going you know in tandem with the concept perfectly um, just finding myself that kind of a journey and just like growing up and just finding out what I wanted to do in life and how I was going to do it and getting back on my feet and kind of that, that kind of element of losing yourself and sort of finding yourself again. And, you know, the, the, along with just my general opinions of my outlook on the world, you know, there's a lot of layered stuff about just like what's going on in the world politically what's going on you know with how people are how the societal structure and then sort of making that into a metaphor of this aquarium of like a food chain as well as like people like if you look at the cover you see the dollar sign kind of being you know cast out on a rod as like bait and then you know you can kind of like grasp what i'm getting at there and like who's at the top there you know doing that and you know, it was not only sort of a lot of interpersonal shit with with me as like a human being, but just also my outlook on the world and, you know, um, and and how I could craft that into this concept. And, you know, it, it all in the end, it all came together really well. I think, you know, uh, um, it started out as just some random 
fever dream when I was 14 of just this random ass cover of me underwater. And, you know, when I finally released it, it just, yeah, you know, it, it ended up being this interwoven, interpersonal, like deep open book. Here's me for, uh, along with this, this geopolitical outlook of everything that was just going on in the world, really. Uh, that's that's how I sort of saw it. And um, shit, there was still so there was also a lot of unreleased stuff uh, on the album as well. And there was, you know, like for, for, for instance, there was like this seven minute track uh, just talking about a lot of political stuff. But I felt like it just didn't suit the cut in contrast with everything else on it. Um, and, you know, I might release it someday. But um, yeah, there's just like a lot of trial and error with that project and a lot of sitting on it, a lot of just listening to shit over and over and over again. And it, I was very intimate with the way I made it. And I think it's my best work i do think you know i do think it is my best work because it's the only project i've made where everything is just my production my mixing every beat every instrument every everything you know this is all me into this project and i think you can't say that about my previous projects where i was just rapping over other people's shit. um but you know but yeah I'm, I'm happy out with aquarium so that's how it all kind of came together in my head and the question that follows from it is is one that you might not want to answer because I know that this is something that kind of defeats the purpose of art sometimes, which is, what did you want people to take away from it? I know that that's a carnal sin because, again, part of the point of art is to let it resonate with the viewer, like you say, beauty being in the height of the beholder, but I also think that one of the critical components of an art, a piece of art, is that there has to be some interpretation on the part of the person listening it or consuming it because they need to participate. They weren't there to make it. But they are there to make it their own. Like I say, both of us share a fondness for Linkin Park because of, it spoke to us. It wasn't written for us, but we both felt like it was on some level. So I guess the question is, what do you want people? What do you want people to take away from it? Or what do you hope people take away from it? I mean, not only like, not only was it therapy for me, not only was it just me just wanting to get some shit off my chest, but I suppose in that deeper layered kind of like you know, overarching messaging that I want people to take away from it, like, you know, the the, 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 the bigger picture, so to speak, um, is just a simplified outlook on how the world really is, you know, on how we really do live in a food chain and how, you know, it isn't fair and how the entire construct of our world isn't necessarily meant for the guppies, so to speak, to win the people at the bottom of that food chain, right? You know, I have like, guppy part one guppy part two for example and guppy part one is uh from the perspective of the top one you know um it's from the perspective of ain't no time for guppies in his game right and guppy part two is damn right we some guppies in his game so it's like people on both sides of the spectrum that are trying to win at life and trying to like you know conquer and be successful in their own right but from vastly different positions in the world and i think from what I want people to take away from that is, you know, just the, the yeah, that, that's really it. It's just that that kind of scope of a food chain, that kind of scope of, hey, there are people at the top that are easily successful that don't want you to win. And there's people at the bottom that are hungry, that are willing to do everything to win. And it's I just wanted to make that simplified outlook um, within this like a sci-fi sort of aquarium concept. And um, as far as the interpersonal stuff, I just... Find yourself you know don't be afraid to take a step don't be afraid to um step outside of yourself and experiment don't be afraid to you know do it all don't be afraid to do something that's out of your comfort zone don't be afraid to open up on a song don't be afraid to produce literally everything on the album don't be afraid to you know step out of your your boundaries of what you're comfortable with experiment and that's sort of one of the few things that I wanted people to take away from it. But, um, you know, I, I know that there are certain things, like I've gotten a lot of messages um, in the response to the album and people took away things that necess weren't necessarily intended when I wrote it, but it like makes sense, right? Like, you know, that, like, especially on deep end and stuff, like people were um, messaging me stuff like, oh, this resonated with me for this reason, X, Y, and Z, but it wasn't what I intended to. And, but in the same breath, it makes sense as to why it would. And I'm happy with that because if it resonates with somebody, even in a way that I didn't intend to write it in the first place, it resonated with them, you know? 
And I, I think that's good. I like music like that, where it's, you know, you, you, you mean it one way, people take it another way, but it makes sense. You get what I'm saying? So that's 100%. That's, that's, that's 100%. And I think it's brave from the perspective of being, I mean, a lot of people want to blog and share things that are personal about themselves, but per, uh, that, that are socially acceptable. And then there are people that want to say something without saying it. And then there's a pure expression. There's the, there's the need to want to be truthful about yourself in your art but then and this is going to be a useful pivot into your uh, uh battle rap career in a second but what i've noticed in both your battle raps and in your music is that you're not afraid to be overtly political and that's interesting in an era where people i don't know if they get turned off by politics but i know a lot of people feel hopeless when it comes to politics and to the systems that that are meant to govern us, that are meant to protect us, that are meant to uplift us. And I think one of the interesting things, though, is that you never come across as overly vitriolic. You never come across as being pessimistic or sarcastic towards it. But you do, there is something, there is, there's a little venom in there. I'm not saying that there isn't, but I am saying, though, that there is a, there's a direct course of action that you're almost preaching in your lyrics and in the way that you approach some of these topics. So my question is, how do you, how do you, well, number one, why? Because I think a lot of people do, they kind of hear politics and they go, uh, I'm not sure. So why would, you know, why do you want to broach those subjects and why do you approach it with that restraint rather than what I think a lot of people do, which is that they start to cheerlead almost. They're almost like, right, uh, who's who's got the most followers right now or who's the most easy like I'm thinking of MMA fighters like uh, Colby Covington for instance his thing is it was entirely gimmick based because behind the scenes none of his rhetoric is part of his actual personality it's just a gimmick he wears like a wrestler so yeah so the questions questions I should say I'm being a greedy little piglet here <laughs> why do you why do you broach those subjects and how do you go about crafting it in such a way that it can be digested by people i suppose like all right well just to touch on what you were saying like i suppose there's two different or multiple different reactions that people could have to sort of political content and music right like depending on how you go about it i mean i've definitely got them all you know what i mean from death threats to support like literal death threats i'm not even kidding but like um you know people hear political jargon and music on whatever side of the spectrum you might be on left right center left whatever right um they get turned off by it because they see music as sort of like a bit of escapism right and i i get that you know and i have songs for that you know what i mean where they're non-political and you know they they don't really touch on a lot of geopolitical topics but um people get turned off by that a little bit and i understand that kind of side of things where they want to use music and they want to use art as a bit of escapism but on the other hand it's just a bit of expression for me as well like like just naturally um i'm interested in a lot of geopolitical topics i keep you know paying attention to everything that i possibly can and i see the world uh pessimistic as this may sound and contrary to what you said like i do see the world uh being just plagued with authoritarianism fascism and just uh general right-wing jargon that is is holding the world back you know i do think you know whatever side you stand on i think objectively conservatism is what holds the world back it conserves um the old and tries to to, to push away the new and that's the most simplest way that i could possibly put it you know i have friends in my life family in my life that are personally affected by a lot of the geopolitical talking points on the right you know i have trans friends you know who literally are fighting for their right to want to literally exist you know what i'm saying i have you know people in the lgbtq uh, lgbtq community as well who you know have just been you know all of these like talking points that just deny their very existence for example you know that's th those are my that's my family that's like people in my life that's people who i want to stand up for you get what i'm saying so when i hear all of these talking points for example on just that one topic alone it just sets a fire under me to just want to like use my art as like a um a way to express that and when it comes to just the politics politics side of things like the leaders in our in any country really just authoritarianism and fascism in general i mean music has always been a way to rebel against that i mean the punk punk literally exists for that reason you know what i'm saying um you know metal a conversation is star in, in a lot because i think what people miss and i understand your point because it is true about people wanting to to have their entertainment as escapism but then you go yeah but it's also a way of 
reintroducing the concept of a conversation between the two sides. Like, we, we want to represent something in a non-literal form so that the core principle can represent itself, which is ultimately resolution. Like, we all have to coexist with each other, and politics are the means that we employ to try to do that. And there's various means that you do that. But when it comes to entertainment partic particularly, the naivety of some people is something that's never lost on me. Because something like... Oh man, I just want my my fantasy and my sight. And then you go, dude. You know, like Lord of the Rings was written by Tolkien, and Tolkien was heavily influenced by his experiences in both world wars. So you go, mm -hmm. like, and like, oh well, yeah, but what about things like Star, Star Wars? Empire Strikes Back is almost unilaterally a condemnation of Ronald Reagan and his regime, exactly. told in the form of a space opera. Like, stormtroopers are literal Nazis. Like stormtroopers are literal like depictions of like Nazism. Like like you know, and not in like a distasteful like you know, like not in a way where it's like okay we promote this, but it's like in a way where in in its own right, in its own world, in its own like world that George Lucas created, it's sort of yeah, it, it sort of represents well, who do you think what the we have in real is supposed to be an allegory of. Like the fact of is course. that 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 first three movies is effectively a retelling of the first fifty years of the twentieth century through the prism of. Like, look, there's this beautiful, a democratic republic. It slowly corrupts from within with, with someone basically preaching peace and just trust me with your security and trust all the while he's fucking both sides, assumes ultimate power and everyone loves him for it, except for the people that know exactly how he obtained it. And you go, wow, this these movies suck. And you go, they do if you just turned up to watch Space Wizards go few, but if you were watching it for something like, actually, this is a rather nuanced retelling of history in the yep. same way that Shakespeare used to do it with fictitious characters and historical events. Like, it's, it's a weird thing, but the point, just bringing it back to yourself, is that he had Lucas and Tolkien and so many others have to bury that ship deeper than they probably would like to, but also Just for the sake of entertainment, yeah. Exactly, but they can make it palatable. And because it does, that message reaches hundreds of millions of people that it probably wouldn't have otherwise. And again, that's that's your challenge, is that ultimately it's not enough to be political. You have to motiv you have to motivate people to listen. So how then one broaches those subjects without turning people off is a tricky it's a tricky prospect. It is, it is. And I will say, like, you know, Kanye is loopy as the man may be right a broken clock's right twice a day and one thing that he did say that you know did resonate with me quite a bit you know as much as i detest his current views um it's all about ideas bro <laughs> it really is because um you know it, you you have to think uh i look at it from the, the what message because think about it you said george lucas and tolkien they use their political messaging it's layered deep but they make complex ideas easy to understand through the entertainment that they create now if we put that in the sphere of music right um the idea that you can use entertainment to make a political message more palatable means that people will walk away with that idea much more it'll resonate in their brain and they'll walk away with it a lot easier rather than just sitting in a a college hall or whatever the hell and you're just listening to a professor moan on for an hour about like geopolitical topics right when it comes to the sphere of rap i mean you have people like tom mcdonald adam calhoun and you know people like that who will promote like a lot of conservative they'll do a lot of right-wing grifting right but it'll resonate with a lot of like right-wingers and it'll amplify a lot of this hatred right and it'll give them like a source and a means to resonate with the with the deep-rooted bigoted hatred that already kind of exists so in my sense i'm just trying to like do the antithesis to that right and even before them like you know this is just what i believe you know what i'm saying like I put what I believe in a song. I want people to resonate with it and, you know, entertain people with it, but also walk away with just a better mentality on certain things or give people like a different perspective. If shit, dude, even if it's one, even if it's one little right wing grifter that like hates gay people or like uh, d doesn't believe in like the income inequality or like the fact that, you know, black people are much more economically disadvantaged than white people, like, you know, e e even though that these are proven facts, right? you could you know argue that you know the, the, the entertainment aspect of that music and the messaging of a better message could be taken away much more easier like through that means right that's what i'm trying to do but with something a little more good you know what i mean like it's something that i believe it's something 
like there are things that I believe it's things that I really stand by but it's also I want people to walk away you know maybe with a new perspective and if I can change at least one mind then great you know what I mean if I can just do as little as get my message out there and have people hear it whether they disagree with it or agree with it fair enough if it sparks the conversation great it's all about ideas and in my perspective it's just getting those the what I believe to be the right ideas out there you know everybody thinks they're right everybody thinks that they're the most fucking correct person in the goddamn world like I try to look at things through as much of an objective scope as I possibly can and there were things that I said in older politically charged songs that maybe were coming from a more naive perspective I look at the Trump song it's my most successful one you know and I I look back at it and I'm like I could have like I have a good heart here I've got a good angle here maybe I could have executed it a little bit better with 23 year old me brain you get what I'm saying I could have like you know if I, it was 23 year old me doing that song back then I could have probably said the right points a bit better you get what I mean like I, I, I'm critical of myself like that and I I, I do think that just like you said with Lucas and Tolkien, you can put that political messaging in there in a palatable way in which has people walking away with a message that they could resonate with a lot more than if you were to just sit down and have a conversation and say it. It's as simple as that, and it's all about ideas. It's as simple as that, I suppose. How does one decide to get into battle rap? How What, what was the catalyst for you? What was the genesis of the moment where you thought, you know what, I want to take a run at that? Honestly, um, okay, so I, like, l l to give you a bit of background here, I lived in America for, like, the first 10 years of my life. I lived in Ireland for the following, like, 10, 12 years of my life. I have now moved to London, and I have been living in London for about now three weeks. So, um, I suppose I was 12 years old, I was living in Ireland, and... I discovered this wonderful thing called Battle Rap through a wonderful league you might know as King of the Dot um, over in Canada. And I got obsessed around the same time that I started producing. Um, and it was just watching it, but even just like discovering the fact that there, there's this whole different sphere of the art form of rap in general. Uh, not just writing to a beat and like being stuck on the the two and four and you know being within the confines of the kick and snare. You get what I'm saying? There's this there's this whole different sphere of acapella where it's free form and you can do much more with it. You are the beat. You are the rhythm, and all that you are doing is carrying and entertaining a crowd with nothing but your voice and the rhythms that you create. And I found this, you know, I mean, I wasn't able to articulate this as well at 12 years of age, but that's what it was, you know, uh, this whole different thing that just uh, like I was obsessed with it and I was hyper fixated on it, hyper fixated on it, much like everything else I was doing, the producing, the singing, the, the, the just rapping in general, like the instruments, everything like battle rap was just another one of those things. Now. I didn't know, or at least I didn't think that there was a battle rap league even remotely in uh, Ireland until I was at the bright age of 20, where I had discovered that there was a wonderful league called Rap is Full, who unfortunately are doing their last event upcoming soon with uh, in collaboration with Premier Battles. But, you know, Rap is Full existed in Ireland and it was like... Uh, one of two leagues, you know, uh, RCI, Rappers Comp Ireland, was its sister league. I didn't discover that until a little bit later. But, you know, me being for years, years, from 12 to present, like, I was obsessed with battle rap. And I, even then, I would just try and just, for fun, write verses in the acapella format and, you know, get a little bit of practice in and see, oh, I want to try and do that, even though, like, and it wasn't against anybody. It was just uh, the acapella format, that free flow sort of thing. Um when I finally found Rap is Full and I got the opportunity to be booked on a league, uh, that's when I was like, I'm getting into it. You know, I always wanted to. I just never thought that there was a means to where I was. I knew that Don't Flop existed. You know, I followed Don't Flop for years, along with King of the Dot around the same time. Premier Battles when it first started. Like, I've been following Battle Rap religiously ever since I was a child. You get what I'm saying? So to finally get the opportunity to do it was really great. And... Uh, my first battle was in a horse stable, but it was good. It was a good battle, battle of the day. And, you know, it was a good first impression. And despite the setting, um, you know, and despite COVID and everything like that, you know, not being able to get in venues and not being able to like actually get a proper place to do it. Like, you know, it, it was a great experience. And, you know, what, much like when I was addicted to it, watching it, I became addicted to just doing it. 
and wanting to get booked as much as humanly possible. And through that, I ended up going to Manchester um, and, you know, facing DARPA. And then um, I ended up facing a lot of people in Ireland as well that were like some of the top heavy heads, you know, people like Nugget, people like Raptor. You get what I'm saying? So people who were like prominent in the Irish scene. And uh, now I'm living in London and now I'm going to be like doing my graft over here and uh, taking off some heads in the London scene, hopefully, and just going back to Manchester again and uh, just trying to build that repertoire and just stack up those, you know, stack up that uh, resume. Um, I just love doing it for fun, man. It's just it's just a really fun thing to do. And it's fun to prep for and the freedom of it that you get um in and of itself and just how different it is it's just it's addicting it's fun and it's just something i'm just hyper fixated on really man just much like everything else i do i suppose the the easy question i want to ask in a moment but the harder question first and it's the one that we can share a moment with oh sorry buzzing damn so again sorry folks i just put my phone on my goddamn recording device again the professionalism is off the fucking charts here right so the um the question I want to ask is because I, I don't know about anyone else, I remember vividly the first time I ever saw Battle Rap and it's because it was such a, it was a, it was a weird thing, it was a moment where I kind of went, what is this, simultaneously with, this is cool, simultaneously with, why am I surprised this is a thing when it's so clearly evident it should be a thing, and it was Shotty Horror versus Arsenal, and I'll tell you what, why I remember it, because it was just weird, a buddy of mine, me and him were putting together an Iron Man suit, don't ask, and he said, hey man, you might like this. And we sat and we watched it. And it's like, this is really entertaining. This is really fun and funny and interspersed with these really dramatic moments where it it threatens violence and there's a da there's a danger to it. And there's this, there's all sorts of things. And it bit me. And it's, and it's one of those things that you kind of get sucked into and you're like, wow, there's more and there's different types. There's different genres of it. There's different performers, different stories. There's a whole web. That it ensnares you, it really does. So the question I have is, what was your what was your jump off point? What was the when when did you get bit by the bug? I suppose it was disaster versus DNA. Disaster versus DNA. That was the very first rap battle, like battle rap rap battle. I mean, like yeah, sure, everybody and their fucking mama's seen Eight Mile and shit, and everybody's seen like Hustle and Flow and shit like that. But that you know what I mean, like. Nah, like into battle rap of what it is today, the modern battle rap acapella format, it was disaster versus DNA. I was fucking blown away. Uh, it, you know, I went on the whole spew of disaster battles and through that I found people like Pat Stay, found people like Bender, uh, rest in peace to Pat Stay and Bender, you know, long live Pat Stay, long live Bender. Um, a, ho a whole bunch of the King of the Dot, the King of the Dot roster, and you know, found people like Arsenal through URL, and through that, I found people over in England like Shoddy Horror, you know, uh, Lunar C, and you know, people like that, and you know, just it, it was much like when I discovered music, it was just the domino effect. Um, but it all started from Disaster versus DNA, I think. That was that was the very first battle I saw, and I was at twelve years of age, and that was when the year it dropped. So, yeah. And going from that, because this is why this th doing this for me is surreal. Like th having the opportunity to talk to people whose art I can just I can consume, digest, form my thoughts, and then have the opportunity to go, "Hey, I have a question about this." It's surreal, okay? As a as a as a person that became a fan, became a musician, but then is like, "Hey, I want to do that," and someone goes, "Okay," and then you get the opportunity to go into a room, and you know everyone's like, "Okay, let's see what he's got." And you know that in this era, most people that attend a battle rap event have some idea. They have they have a palette. They have an expectation, and more importantly, they have standards that are very, very strictly um, applied. In my experience, and that's not a, that's not a diss at battle rap fans. It's just they they hold their craft and the people that undertake their craft to an exceptionally high standard. What's it like? I, the prep, I imagine, was absolutely torturous because it's like, oh god, it's my first one, I need to fucking nail this. But that moment where it's like, okay, round one, it's on you. Talk to me about that moment and talk to me about the feelings of executing and of sticking it and then going, right, let's go again. Right, Um. so I suppose, you know, much like because like at the time i started first battling i was already like an experienced performer i had done shows i had done uh you know i i had gotten to the 
the I, th- I suppose the habit of being able to memorize shit and you know go through that process of muscle memory and you know and like even memorizing verses on beat it's like you know once you get your first word and if you know it well enough you can just kind of carry it on if you just go on autopilot kind of thing right and that's I, I suppose that's literally it you know uh you know just prepping over and over and saying it to the point where once you get your first word of your first round you can just you can just go you know what i mean and um it was just muscle memory it really is and i suppose the prep of it you know in the beginning yeah it was stressful you know what i'm saying it was just like oh i don't want to choke i don't want to fucking make myself look like an idiot you know i don't know what i'm not going to uh there was the known knowns and then there was the unknown unknowns shit you didn't expect that was going to go wrong or maybe that you didn't realize that you needed to improve on a lot of people don't realize this it ain't like making music in a lot of aspects i mean it is in the sense of like memorization but in terms of like performing you know the shit that you have to do to compensate for not having a beat behind you is is paramount and that's something that you know i i I suppose i understood and heard a lot of people say but i didn't really understand until i started doing it it's you know there's certain things that you just you gain through the experience of actually being there and doing it and going through those trials and errors you know i only i've had eight battles now i'm going on my ninth which february 24th deberk london um like it's it's that performing aspect it's the projection it's the being loud enough it's the being animated enough and not standing there like a fucking statue you know what i'm saying it's just like it's not just your words it's how you say them with conviction it's how um you know you you grasp the crowd it's the nuances of like timing you know what i mean it's the nuances of comedic timing a lot of people in battle rap don't like to be compared to like stand-up comedy and shit you know because they think oh that's corny bro but it, in a lot of instances it is because like um it's not necessarily always comedic timing but it is timing you know what i mean it's like when the punchline hits how the punchline hits the, the the cadence in which you say that punchline if something's a little bit off it might not hit as hard as if you were to say it like this or say it like this if you were to say it loud or like have a little bit of a space or go really fast or have like a build up you know there's so many different things with the freedom that you can do that you can't do on the beat but given that the downside of that is there's certain things that you might not realize that you have to do when you don't have that beat behind you and through experience i suppose that's sort of like the things i realized through the experience of doing it yeah so i i noticed this versus your uh, battle of raptor and you were going almost continuously for 10 minutes and the thing that stuck stuck out to me not only the fact that you were almost flawless i think there was maybe one tiny little moment we had to readjust and even that moment was brought about by the fact that you did something that a lot of people are reticent to do which is you engage someone in the audience but you let them respond that's unusual most guys want to go hey man shut the fuck up you're not in this battle but no you took the second to go right no he's gonna say something back right give it a sec right remember i'm in the middle of a performance recompose and it didn't ruin the round it didn't ruin the flowing cadence it didn't necessarily uh, lose the audience because sometimes that that un- unelicited hostility can be a bit of an audience disconnect for some people because it's like oh this threatens to spill you know it's it's we've all seen it at battle rap events where someone gets a bit too you know like, oh my god don't okay. touch me or oh man it's personal and then suddenly the audience is like oh 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 i don't like this but when you were talking about the cadence and the and the, the highs and the lows what's unique to battle rap is when a punch lands it's almost always because the audience feels it's earned now it could be a oh in terms of oh he'll take that let's see how he reacts to a that's objectively funny there's a whole myriad of different reactions it's not just laugh not laugh and so one of the things that i noticed from your performances though is this this dedication to not only the uh the audience but to the camera, to your opponent. But like I say, there's a, again an overarching consistency. There's an ebb and a flow. There's a lack of, there's a lack of any real. Ah, uh, what? How do I phrase this? There's, there's a polish. There's, there's just a confidence. There's an assurance that I don't see in other battlers. There's some battlers that you can see are almost fishing. They're like they throw it out there and hope. Right. I hope it gets the reaction back. And. I don't see that with you, not in the sense that I'm not saying that you're angling for it, but it's the thing that I think more battlers should be doing, which is, look, dude, you need to have confidence in what you're saying, because that will translate. 
the audience will remember that he walked into this and he didn't flinch when something... The only person I've ever seen translate it was Shuffle T. And that's only because he calls it out ready to go, expected more. And he makes a joke of it. He's the only person that's like, well, if, if they sleep on it, I'll just joke about it. But everyone else is like, okay. And it's all, all don't like that. So what I wanted to ask is, like, where does that, is that what you were saying about the muscle memory and the fact that you've got reps and the fact that you've got audience, uh, audience, um, not manipulation, but you, you know how to cater to a crowd so that they get what they need and they get what they want? Or is there something more about battle rap that's something you've had to engage with since then that differs from your live performances with music? I suppose um, the one of the big things about battle rap is diversion of expectations. You know, th that is applicable to a lot of my performances. And, you know, the audience thinks it's going to go one way, but then it goes this way. And then that usually, you know, makes them react in what, depending on the context of what you're doing and what you're leading up to. And the, the example you use with shuffle with the expected more, where you're kind of thinking all, on your feet and you're going outside of what you plan to do. Um, that's that, that, that's really fucking, you know, it's good. And when it came to like my round against Raptor, the 10 minute one, um, I had purposely had a section with nothing written I, I was like all right i have this giant bulk of the round it was about like half maybe three quarters of the way through and then i was like all right i'm gonna have a freestyle section for 30 seconds and if you look at my notes it's literally just freestyle section 30 seconds and then i knew the end point of where i was ending on the written shit and then starting the freestyle stuff and i knew the beginning part of when i was weaving back into it and whatever was going to be said in there was going to be said if it completely flopped it completely flopped if it didn't it didn't it quite frankly it was just me throwing shit at a wall till it stuck because i wanted to try something because i had seen a lot of like the top tier battle rappers in the world like people like this people like pat people like the Saurus, who are able to freestyle and able to do it mid-round i wanted to try it you know and that 10 minute round was just a whole experiment thing for me that i was pushing despite the criticisms and shit um so that that was just literally that but it's another thing that's really important in battle rap i suppose is self-awareness right which being on the spectrum a little bit you know what i mean being a, got a touch of the tism right that's not something that was one of my greatest strengths to begin with right but like um that's another thing like shuffle is really great at that you know um it, it's, it's having that self-awareness to even if you fuck up you just like point it out you know what i mean or if something just happens in front of you you just like break out of the if you know your material enough and you and you lock it in enough uh, you can do stuff like that. You can freeze space in your brain to be able to, to to step out a little bit and just point something out. You know what I mean? Um, and it's usually shit like that that'll get people reacting if it's good. Um, but just having, the, even when you're just planning and writing stuff, just what you're saying in your written stuff, that self-awareness is always usually a strength. If you have more self-awareness than your opponent, then you're almost always going to have more of an advantage in terms of like what you're saying to them, in terms of the angles you can come up with, because you're able to point out things that they're not even able to see or realize or like come to realize. And gaining that self-awareness is usually for me anyway it's not only just watching back my performances and like criticizing like oh i look like a fucking idiot the way i was moving here right it's it's what your opponent's saying to you you know things that your opponents might point out about you that you didn't even conceptualize or realize about yourself and then you can use that and you can either play into it you know what i mean you can play into it you can you know make, make it a thing to where it disarms that angle right you know you'll see a lot of people doing that if somebody says something about me fine if it's an effective angle i'll just fucking play into it or like do what i can to disarm that and use counter self-awareness to be like hey you know what i mean like this thing or whatever the hell so um i think yeah it's a diversion of expectations and a bit of self-awareness and i think when it comes to making an audience react those are the two sort of main uh ingredients um when it comes to even freestyling written stuff timing everything th those two things really encompass it all i suppose um who did you say your next battle is against d burke d burke um d -Burke. he's uh, d burke d burke where does that name ring a bell where does that i don't name i'm not surprised it doesn't i don't know i feel like i've heard the name something to do with the plug pre something i don't know yeah. Of course, of course we, of course we know who De Berg is. But my question was going to be, considering um, it seems to me Prem and uh, it probably isn't just them. Um, a few people have got him in the in in mind as as a future star and someone that they're looking to to really push. 
My question is, how do you feel about going against someone like him at the moment? Because his um, his following on YouTube is sizable, and I think that's fair to point out. And the fact that he's had a couple of good battles, and his his most recent outing against my good friend Dub T, he uh, unilaterally got the decision. So he's he's riding on a, a bit of a high right now, and I think people have got some um, you know they've got expectations on where he can go. So. Not saying that that's something that counts against you, but I know that's something that might... It's something to be wary of when battling someone like that, especially considering yep. that you're still making your name despite a sizable internet presence yourself. So my question is, well, number one, how do you feel about the battle coming up, just generally speaking, like as an opponent, as your skills versus his, but also just this added element of the fact that you guys are at the forefront of what is kind of still the rebuild you guys are still in the position of being at the forefront of making battle rap in the uk at least what they want it to be which is at least somewhat reminiscent of that golden period between 2013 and 17 where they just couldn't seem to miss just every battle was fucking killing it um and they want you guys to be that successful so how do you feel about being part of that process knowing that that's gonna be an element to this battle I feel like with Deep Work, right, is that I already exist. We don't need that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm playing with him. Respect to Deep Work, I think he genuinely is one of the um, the better lyricists of the short circuit crop. And I think I would go as far as to say he's the best of the short circuit crop. You know, um, Trubb's putting together his short circuit events in London. He him creating essentially a whole like new set of a roster of like newcomers and shit. And I think, you know, Trubb's is a wonderful matchmaker. I think he's one of the best matchmakers in Prem. Um, this match makes sense. You know, him, and, him and Bloodstro, thing, by the way, just to throw it out there. Sorry, I just I have to because I don't get an opportunity to throw their flower to give them flowers. That you've hit the nail on the head there in the sense that Premier Battles probably started off with this idea that everyone free for all, whatever. They both look at it as now we're building a brand based on a roster, based on performers who are looking to build their own brands. It's a symbiotic thing where we can't just keep feeding people to other people because then what happens? They end up being. Battlers that make names for themselves, and then the battlers that they've beaten along the way fade into the mm -hmm. distance and they never battle again. And it's 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 so common when you look at some of the stars of the scene, like a Lunacy, like a Shotty, and stuff, you go, great. Who did their opponents battle afterwards? And it's sometimes maybe one, two, or never again. But Prem understands, and I think don't fly for cotton in on, it's this idea of, nah, guys, we need to start thinking about this in terms of how do we promote long term? How do we build stars? How do we build performers? How do we build cards? That means mm -hmm. that when someone comes to an event, they remember the event and that performers can come in and know that it's not just a case of, uh, okay, so Red Wolf, great, good news. Uh, you're battling Bizzo, he's the champ. So uh, take the loss like a champ and uh, we'll move on. And it's like, no, 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 no. We've got an idea for you. Let's pitch this idea. It's De Burke. And it's like, okay, cool. Here's what we've got in mind. Here's why we think it's a good matchup. And here's what we foresee in certain situations, they do that. And I appreciate that both Stro and uh, Trubs do that on a regular basis. They still haven't like lost that touch of thinking about, nah, man, there's always someone new. There's always someone fresh and there's always a star in the waiting. We don't, we don't serve any purpose by just lining up people for Biz or for Bobby or for exactly. anyone along those lines. I will, I will say this, right? Like Bloodstro, Briggs, Trubs, like the whole staff at Prem, like they know what the fuck they're doing and they know why they're doing shit for a reason. Like the matchmaking that they do is for a reason. And I think in, in the instance of me versus d -Berg, stylistically, it makes a lot of sense. We rap similarly, um, though me better, um, like we do rap similarly and, you know, like the, you know, the narrative with the YouTube stuff and like our come ups are very similar. So it's like, it, it, it does make sense. And I think with the d -Berg match in particular, um, there's a difference. And I keep saying this on interviews, podcast spaces. I will reiterate this little phrase that I say. There's a huge difference between people that I feel like I have to write for you. I mean, like, okay, you know, short for matchups, Red Wolf, Battleless guy, you know, not a lot of people like, you know, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Versus somebody that I want to write for, where I feel like, you know, this person drives a lot out of me. And Burke is one of those people. And you, you would think, oh, yeah, he's uh, I'm a step up for him. I'm, he's sort of a step down for me. But it's like um, him as a rapper and him as just like, you know, him, 
it, it draws a lot of ideas out of me and I feel like I can create more. So I think that makes it much more dangerous for him and much more dangerous for anybody in general. If I feel like I really want to write for you, that's where the danger is. That's where, you know, I know I'm going to be at my best, you know, because I just draw a lot from you. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is one of them battles. And so much so that I've got like extra material in the bag. Like I've already put it this way. I had locked three rounds worth of material by the time that the battle was like publicly announced, right? Ever since then, it was just writing extra shit just for fucking fun. Because I can. Because, you know, maybe I'll just like, depending on the situation, depending on what he says, I might pull this bit out, put it there, pull this bit out, put it there. No, nah, I might, you know, stick to the script and do it exactly the way I'm going to do it here. But just to have it, you know what I'm saying? Just to, to, to for fun, because I feel like it. That's that's the kind of battles that I love the most. And I feel like this battle has drawn a lot of motivation out, out of me more than... I'd say since, uh, fuck, the only time I've been this motivated to write for was like the Raptor battle, you know, the 10 minute one, you know, like the 10 minute battle in and of itself, whoever the fuck that was going to be against was something that I was like super, you know, motivated because writing a 10 minute round is, you know, like a feat of my own personal goals, despite the criticisms. Right. But now with D-Burke, it's like, okay, you got somebody, we got some shit to talk about. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's, uh, it's going to be the battle of the night. It's going to be the battle of the night. A lot of people got Slim Buck RX, and I think that's going to be amazing. A lot of people have like Raw's Dojo. I think that's going to be amazing. I think people are sleeping on this one. I think Red Wolf versus Deberg is going to be the battle of the night. And, you know, I say that with all respect and I say that with full confidence. Just the way we rap, the way that the things that we're going to say to each other, I can already see it from a mile away. It's going to draw a lot of energy in the room. And I'm excited to, I'm excited to do this. I really am. And I'm, it's going to be judged. So, like, all of my clashes have been judged, same as him, so I think we have that in common as well. And, um, yeah, it's, it, I'm excited for it. I can sense it in the energy in your voice, and there's nothing wrong, ladies and gentlemen, we're telling people you're going to tear the house down, and you're going to steal, you're going to, to aim to steal the show, uh, because if nothing else, that gives you a certain mindset of going into it like, right, I've said it now, I need to fucking back this, I need to I need to fucking deliver because it needs mm -hmm. to meet my expectations so it meets the audiences. But the the bigger question is, of course, now that you're you're a fair way into your battle rap journey is and this is always a difficult one I find for for, for battlers to answer because again the scene is still in its not in its infancy, but it in certainly in a in a sort of a um, another phase of its development in terms of the modern era of content creation. You know, the the shorts, um, you know, um Oh God, his name is is uh, it's it's uh, Burris. Um, Anderson, Anderson Burris. Burris. There, there he is. Um, he's kind of at the forefront as far as battle rap is concerned in my mind because he is just a fucking relentless clipping machine when it comes to his yeah. fucking battles. Which, by the way, makes him look great, except for when you actually watch the battles in their entirety, you go, "Hang on, he had an opponent. Wow." It's, it sure is easy to look like you win battles when you clip only one side, but that's part of his gimmick is that he's like, no, but it's me. I want to promote myself and, and my, my abilities as a battle rapper. But the point I'm making with him is he's become very, very successful doing that. And he's become someone who's really embraced this era of content creation in the sense of I only have 30 seconds to hook people, man. And if that's it, I'm not going to spend time complaining about it. I'm going to get on with the work. And he really has. But battle rap in general, at least in the UK, is still coming to grips with that it's still it's still modernizing itself so the thing with you specifically because i know that you fit into this is what are your ultimate aspirations within battle rap what is battle rap a conduit for or what is it to you as is it is is it just a thing that you want to indulge in i guess or is it something that's a means to an end or do you see yourself like i see a lot of battle rappers which is man i want battle rap to do better and i want to carve my own legacy within that i i simultaneously want to be part of its success but i want to be successful in it because it's quite and again where that ends up being is hard because again no one quite knows where the scene's going right now except for that it is going up that there is traction so where do you see yourself in that i see there's two main goals that i had Going into it before meeting the wonderful people that are in this scene, you know, um, you know, my, my own self-serving goal, I suppose, is to battle the best in the world in every country. That, that there is a battle rap scene. That that is like in summary, that is my personal goal 
as Red Wolf, the battle rapper, right? Is to battle the best in the world in every single country where there's a battle rap scene. Best in Canada, best in the US, best in London, England, Manchester, like, you know, Ireland. I already battled the best in Ireland. I already did that. You know what I mean? I battle Nugget, I battle Rap Thor. I already battled the best in Ireland. I'm, 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 I want to work my way up to uh, get, get the best in the UK get the best in Canada, work my way up the ranks fairly, you know what I'm saying? Because there's a system and I understand that and I respect that. And that's my own personal goal. But through meeting the people, being a part of the scene, seeing the hard work that goes behind the scenes, the people who film it, the people who edit the videos, meeting the league owners, meeting the battlers, you know, seeing the state that battle rap is in, whether people want to look at that with a positive or negative outlook, I do want to do what I can to better the scene. You know, I know that like, given it's you know I, i've had a lot of ups and downs where people where nobody's watching me where everybody's watching me i've blown up and fall, fell off three times over i know that i can blow up again you know what i'm saying like i'm it, you know i've done this shit like you know more than a lot of people have and that's not coming from a place of ego i'm just objectively looking at it right i want to do what i can to give back to the scene and you know get it in front of eyes you know what i'm saying and that's what everybody's doing really you know what i'm saying using their battles using their content using their clips using their platform building their own audiences um to, to to get eyes on the battle rap scene i love the people in this scene i you know they've done a lot for me in very dark times i've made very very close friends through this scene that i talk to every single day i'm in group chats every single day chatting to these folk like they're my, my best mates honestly and you know um that, that, that that's special that really is you know i mean when i felt like i had nobody at the time I had battle rap, you know what I'm saying? I had my music, of course. I had, you know, the people who appreciated that. And, you know, of course, but like battle rap did a lot for me personally and, and, and kept me going in very dark times. I mean, shit, my first battle was the week my grandmother died. Dead ass, just the week my grandmother died. That was my first battle, you know? But somewhere along the lines, I was going through some fucking breakup and I was all Mr. Depressy or whatever the fuck. But like, that was, you know, I, for some reason, I just go through a lot of shit and I lead up to a battle. This was, this is like, you know this is no different you know moving to a different country and like going through you know the, the stresses of that like you know moving to london and you know getting set up here you know it was you know in the lead up to the deberg battle is what i've been going through now you know um but but i suppose it showed my own strength and it showed who's there and it you know it provided me a scene of people that really are just really good people at the end of the day i mean you, if you're a just complete normie and you've never you're not even into rap you just work at a fucking you know a little or something okay and like you're just like you get up you go to work you, you listen to music on the way to work you take one good shit and you go to bed right if you're just one of them right and you're just looking at battle rap for the first time you're seeing all this like hostility and you're seeing all of this like crazy like energy and you, you think oh my god they must all fucking hate each other we don't we don't we all fucking love each other we're all a goddamn family and you know you know, being a part of that scene after years of just being a fan, after years of just watching it and studying the craft, you know, and just, you know, having my own personal goals, I want to give back to the scene in any way that I possibly can. And 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 to me, that's through building an audience of my own, watching Red Wolf battles and, you know, giving a platform to, you know, new eyes on the scene. That's essentially in whatever way I can. So I have two goals. It's battle everybody that is the best in the fucking world in each country that has a battle rap scene. That's just my own little personal goal. And then um, give back to the scene that has given a lot to me, both interpersonally and just, you know, a platform in general. And that's that, that's pretty much it. Two more questions. And, and the first question is a follow on from that, because you mentioned something there about battling in different provinces. One of the interesting things I think about Battle Rap right now is that there are hot spots, but then there are also areas where Battle Rap is just insanely popular. Like apparently in Germany, the scene is really healthy. Um, yep. There's provinces in, in Russia, there's um, other European countries where Battle Rap has its, it, it, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not a weekly thing, but when it's thrown, it's an event. It's something that people fucking flock to. And I think about the scene now, and I think about its international reach and the fact that there are people who were probably in better positions than others, especially through a historical context where you had guys who grew up rapping in certain areas of the country and then struggled just going from north to south or south to north, for instance. But then yep. there's this current generation who haven't really known any different. It's the thing where they've gone from north to south and east to west and everywhere in between. So they know how to get over with multiple audiences who you could then take and put in a foreign country and it wouldn't make a lick of difference. But they would then be like, man, 
I've wanted to travel the world and I've wanted to battle everybody and everywhere. Like, how do you feel about potentially being one of those names? Like, I know that there's a couple of other guys that have expressed uh, 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 expressed and expressed interest in, man, I want to battle across the world. How would it feel being put in a position where you might be asked to do that? You might be asked to say, listen, man, we need you to step up. We need you to represent not only yourself, but the promotion. As we said, because they've shot, he's talked a big game this year. Prem's talked a big game this year. Don't Flop's talked a big game this year. You might be the name that they call on. How do you feel about that? When and where? Simple as that. When and where? Like, um, I, I like you said, there like the battle rap is blowing up in countries that you know a lot of people on the outside looking in wouldn't necessarily expect. The Philippines have a beautiful scene. I mean, there was points where they were selling out full-on stadiums for, with battle rap audiences. Germany, as you said, you know, what I mean, Quill just went over there recently. You know, shout out to Quill, like he absolutely killed it. You look at that crowd, like holy shit. You know what I'm saying? And that's normal for them. You get what I'm saying? Russia as well with Oxymiron, like, you know what I'm saying? Like Oxymiron, like, um, uh, being like a superstar over there, you know, selling out of venues and everything that he does, you know? Um, I, I think the leagues at the minute, you know, are in a more collaborative stage than they were. Like back in the day, you'd just see a lot of fucking uh, URL versus King of the Dot, or you'd see like Premier Battles versus Don't Fly. I think the more league collaboration internationally is uh, you know sharing rosters and getting people to you know flown over and getting deals made like that like you know it, it needs to be done more this year i'd love to see english battlers u.s battlers going over to the philippines going over to germany and like if i'm one of those people if if, if the league owners feel that i fucking earned it and if i do fucking earn it and this year i plan to be as active as i possibly can um if i earn one of those international plates then so be it tell me when and where and let's get it fucking done then like honestly um and just the experience of being able to travel the world and um perform internationally in any context music battle rap fucking poetry like you know, look at scoop you know what i'm saying like scoop's killing it right now um you know it, it's a privilege in and of itself you know like you Let's be real. Battle rap ain't making bags. And that was a recent conversation of like, you know, controversy. And like, you could say like U.S. makes more bags than the U.K. does or Germany does this or whatever. You could. Who cares? Right. The, the, the act of being able to, you know, get the privilege to go to another country and entertain this giant crowd of people that you've never in a country you've never been in before. And they appreciate that. And you get that shit on your resume. That is you know something that means a lot to me and in battle rap that's like my goal so if if they call on me if they feel like i'm the right man for the job on one of them cards internationally let's fucking go simple as that man tell me when and where and then the final question which is um just i, I guess i guess the, the natural progression of things is where do you ultimately see your career going i mean what are your ultimate aspirations in terms of being a musician live performer do you see yourself transitioning into other mediums and and, and genres or do you see yourself becoming more of a uh, trying to master your craft more and more or um there's a, there's a multitude of different directions one can go in as far as producing things these days but i guess where do you see yourself if you could plot your own cre uh, career trajectory where do you see yourself in years to come you, know, you tell God your plans and he'll fucking laugh in your face. But you know what? I'll tell you what. Look, I think I said it earlier. It's like, you know, I want to like I have more realistic goals with music and just being an entertainer in general. I mean, it's not just about being a fucking viral sensation. You can get uh, 500,000 views versus like a million views and you can be more successful, like uh and sustainable than the artist who gets a million views like i, I my, my aspirations in music and entertainment is to just make it a sustainable career have many and, and realizing that you know in order to do that you need multiple streams of income it's not just putting all your eggs in one basket you know like it's no secret battle rap don't make that much money but like it's for me battle rap's like fun as fuck and you get to travel internationally and do that that's a privilege and to earn that is what i want to do as a performer as a musician you know i want to make it a sustainable income i want to be able to you know make this my job i want to be able to you know put food on the table by just doing that without you know in, in the field of entertainment whether it's through producing for people mixing and mastering for people like um uh, getting people in the studio to record um my own music my streaming revenue which you know i'm saying like um being on stage performing at festivals doing shit like that you know and i've done it it's just a matter of doing that more consistently enough to where you know, it's it, that's what's putting the food on the table, and that's the only thing that's putting the food on the table. As far as like other aspirations beyond like music that are in the field of entertainment, like I've never 
beyond like shit in the school i want to get into acting you know that, that there's a little thing for you i haven't said that before but like i do want to get into acting i do you know the best in the world at it by any means but like you know what i mean i think i want to get into if i can go <laughs> Before I die, before I am literally a rotting corpse or ashes in a freaking jar, okay, I want to be on, like, some form of a TV show or movie. Like, before I die. That's just, like, one of my personal goals. I think I have a natural knack for acting. I'd like to try it, whether it's a small role, big role, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? However that happens, it's just something I'd like to do. That's that's sort of, like, a little extra thing to tick off of my fuck it list. So. Bonus question, then. If you could assume a role... Or if you could write yourself a role into a TV show. Because, dude, uh, um, uh, this it's a joke, but I've always said this. If I could, the one thing I'd want to be in is I'd want to be in the Flash CW television series. And I'd want to be the guy that every episode after the Flash has had his ass kicked goes, Have you tried running a bit faster? <laughs> and then he does, and he wins, and everyone high fives at the end because of my great idea. And I just do that every episode. It can be like Norm and like, Hey, Norm, what do you got for us? It's like... Hey, has he tried running faster? My God, I think he's in or something. Like, <laughs> like, what would you want to do? Like, if if you could if you could fashion a role for yourself, or if you could assume the role that someone else has adopted, or if you is there a TV show that you're just a, oh man, it'd be so cool to be in that. I think. Uh, all right, I'll give you like main role and supporting role. Right, so main role, put me in like a fucking samurai movie or some shit. I mean, look at me, right? Like, or like, I don't know, put me in some like equalizer ass shit you know what i'm saying where he's like 15 fucking guys versus one or whatever the hell silly is that sound or whatever that'd be a cool main role kind of that's, that, that, those are my cool movies or to be in like an apocalypse movie or something like that like that'd be a cool main role like if we're like an apocalypse movie or, you know like you ever see the book of eli that shit's amazing if you're obviously like the walking dead and like shit like that i mean it'd be great you know what i mean if i could get a role and something like that that's just pipe dream shit but you know what i mean but as far as like a supporting role i suppose like um the anti-hero sort of like character you know what i mean like uh, i don't know like that the, like the anti-hero sort of side character uh I don't, I don't know what i compare it to but that, that's the best way i could sort of describe it now but watch yeah this, watch the space you never know hey listen man stranger things uh, i mean you, you never know where people are going to pop up or when someone's going to pop them and goes do you know what? i know a guy for this and 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 suddenly there you are you're in so all right man well listen like the, I, again, that, I lied. Apparently, there's two more questions because we've just asked one and then we asked another. The most critical, the most important of questions, the single most imperative thing one must ask in the obligatory podcast format sphere is plugs. Plugs. We need to know where you are. We need to know where we can support you. We need to know what your socials are, where people can buy your t shirt, where people can see your movie, where people can see the mural of you painted on the moon. All of these things and more can be available at www.redwolf.org. I don't know. But, like, where can people find you? Where, where can people support you? Where can people follow you? And more importantly than all of those things, what have you got coming up that people may not be aware of that you want people to be aware of? Okay, so if you want to check out uh, pretty much all the content I've done, you can go to youtube.com slash the real red wolf. That's youtube.com slash the real red wolf. Twitter is the same. It will be Red Wolf Aquarium on Spotify. That is Red Wolf Aquarium on Spotify. Um, I have my battle with D Burke, which is going to be in the engine rooms in London on the 24th of February. That's going to be crazy. Get your tickets for that and come see a whole bunch of really dope performances from everybody. It's a very stacked card and you're going to enjoy every single one of them. And that's pretty much it, man. Uh, thank you for having me on. Man. Oh, fucking hell. Thank you very much. Of course, I will just preface all of that by saying, assuming tickets are available, do not waste time checking just go get take your credit card or debit card out yep. right now go on the internet just go to any website just start spending money wherever and sooner or later you'll get onto the website and buy the tickets but don't wait do it now because there may not be tickets left if you wait because it's going to be insane it's going to be super hot fire right very fire very fire get up and snatch them up it's a small room but that's the best kind of battle rap energy the small pits you know what i'm saying so snatch them tickets and there's only a little bit away so get them now there you go, you see. I, I gave a promising career in sales to do this. I didn't really. There's no way I can sell. I can't sell shit for anything. But dude, I really appreciate you taking the time. And it was a pleasure going through your back catalogue of songs and music and also your battles. 
because if nothing else, man, I know you're not a newcomer in the stricter sense of the word, but I'm really interested to see what happens with you and a few other guys, because I have a sneaking suspicion that the scene's going to be not only better for you guys and you specifically being in it, but I think it's going to start to factor you in in ways that we're not quite aware of yet it will I, I again I, I, I it's just some some and it's just a theory and all the rest of it it's not really a theory I'm told things but the point is that like I'm really excited and it was a pleasure to get in on the ground floor with you in certain respects so thank you so much for coming and sharing all that stuff with me man well thank you for the conversation man you've been absolutely wonderful and uh quite frankly one of my favorite interviews I've done so thank you very much man and everybody go subscribe uh uh seriously like this is a fucking great show go check out his interview with gas buff reverb um you know the, the the guy puts a lot of good journalism um and he asks the right questions and he articulates himself very well so thank you very much man for having me on i appreciate it i'm gonna cut all that last part i'm gonna, I'm gonna cut all that i'm gonna get rid of all